Hi everyone, hey, thank you again for joining me. I am so grateful for the opportunity to be able to connect with you. And again, I wish I was with you on, in person and that we could be gathering together, but I hope that you are doing well. I hope you're staying safe and that you are staying healthy. And um, I'm just hoping and praying that God is really giving you the encouragement, not just physically, but also emotionally and spiritually. I know this is a really frustrating time and um, it's not only frustrating, but it's also a little bit depressing, isn't it? As we just uh, you know keep going on with each day and even with all of the recent things happening around us, I know that this can be really difficult. So I want you to know I'm thinking of you, I am praying for you, and I hope that you are just trusting God through this really difficult time. Um, I just want to say again, thank you to all of the Hillside family. Thank you for those of you who have been um, giving toward our, our uh, fixing things up and repairs and remodeling and especially toward our brand new chairs. And so thank you. You can keep, you know, all of those gifts coming. We appreciate it so much. And I'm really excited when we can get back together. And I'm just grateful for all of you being able to participate, even though you're not able to be there on Sundays now. Um, I know when we get together, it'll be a wonderful atmosphere and I'm really excited to meet you in that room. But, um, you know, as we continue actually and conclude this two-part series, I usually don't do series that are this short, but um, I really took one message and I'm splitting it in half and I'm calling this God is great, God is good. You know, all of us in our journey in life sometimes say, you know, is God really good? Is God really great? And it might be during a time like this where we've got a lot of natural disasters happening, um, it could be from bad news from a friend, it could be a situation, some kind of tragic circumstance that you go through personally or in your family. Um, but I mean, again, look at us now. I mean, we are surrounded by fires, uh, you know, caused by lightning in the middle of a pandemic while outside is a heat wave. That's why I'm preaching inside today, actually, because it's just so hot and smoky outside. But maybe as a kid, I don't know if you learned this, but as a kid, I learned this prayer. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for the food. By his hands, we all are fed. Now, I don't know about that all. Here we're praying this all are fed. I read, I read this week that around 9 million people die every year of of, of uh, hunger or hunger related diseases. So I don't know about, well, let's get back to the prayer. Give us Lord our daily bread. And now I think I really would much rather have much more than just daily bread, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you kind of like to have a little bit of a store up, have some stuff in the bank, you know, have some preparation for the future. But uh, you know, that's actually not a very good prayer at all. Why, why do parents teach their kids this prayer? <laughs> right? But the fact of the matter is, is that eventually, no matter what our background is, uh, you might be a Christian, you might not be a Christian, you might not be sure where you're at. There is some point that, we're, we, that we say, God, what are you doing? Uh, we ask questions like, where is God? How could God allow this? What, then if you're really sophisticated, you might ask yourself or you know, ask someone else even the question um, that I think is absolutely worthless, really. And that is, did God cause it or did God allow it? <laughs> You know, to me, it doesn't really make much difference whether God caused it or God allowed it. I mean, if I'm standing there and one of my daughters, I'm right there, and I watch one of my daughters step off of a rock and fall down and get seriously injured, you know, whether I pushed her or just did nothing and allowed it, um, either way, I'm a bad father, you know. But saying that God didn't cause it, but he just allowed it, doesn't help me as much. It probably doesn't help you either. So, so God, what are you up to? What is really going on? Are you really good? Are you really great? Even if you're an agnostic, maybe you're even an atheist, um, at some point, I'm just guessing, but at some point you probably, even if it's just for a moment, you probably look up and you say, if you're there, <laughs> do something, you know, whoever you are, do something, or, or you know, wh why won't you do something? Or Please, you know, help me out of this mess. You, yes, you might quickly go back to not believing, but for a second there, you ask, is God good? Is God great? And last week, we had the audacity to say, yes, God is good and God is great. We, we said that. In fact, Scripture teaches us that God is so good and that he's so great. And I know this didn't, wasn't very exciting, this message, but he, he is so good and he is so great that when sin entered the world, God judged it severely because that is what a good and great God would do. Now, don't confuse the word good with just nice, 
okay? God is good in his righteousness, in his holiness. He is great in his power. And he couldn't turn his back on sin and pretend that it didn't happen. Um, a good parent wouldn't do that with their children. A good and great God is, is righteous. He's holy. And so he must judge sin and he must judge it severely. Now, we also saw that when God had the world just the way he wanted it, it was really the way we would want it too. <laughs> it was perfect. And that's really the way we would love to have the world right now. Everything was just right. When sin entered the world, though death and sorrow and, and disease and famine, all these terrible things entered into the world. And we also saw that the third point was that God judged man and everything that was under man's authority. This meant, and, and this was new for, for some of us, but um, this meant that God judged earth, the globe, the environment, everything. And since that day, the earth hasn't cooperated with us at all. Um, regardless of where you are spiritually, here's what we do have in common. We all know that the world doesn't function the way it ought to function. Um, if you have a yard, you know that already. <laughs> it just, it seems to always default to, uh, you know, disorder. Um, the weeds come and grow and thrive much easier than the plants that you tend toward. So weather doesn't cooperate with us, right? This, this week, um, 11,000 lightning strikes, you know, over a 72 hour period ignited over 300, literally hundreds. I, I, I read just today that there's like something like 500 different fires going on in California right now. Uh, would you say that, you know, it's not cooperating? I, I would say that. We know that the world isn't the way it ought to be because the way it ought to be, and we can just kind of uh, speculate a little bit, but you know, every, you know, every day the sun should rise and the sun should set. They should be beautiful sunrises and sunsets. And, and it would rain and it would rain just enough to water the land and to pro provide enough water for us, but, um, but never cause a flood. Um, the, the beach would be beautiful and the waves would be wonderful and fun to surf and to swim in, but, but they would always stay where they should, put, should be staying. You know, they would always stay in their own place. The, the waves would never come into neighborhoods. You know, they, they would stay where they belong. Um, if lightning's going to flash, lightning should flash, you know, vertically, not horizontally, or rather horizontally, not vertically. It should, you know, go from right to left, you know, and be, be beautiful that way, not up and down and hit things and start fires like we've, like we've been seeing. Um, clouds should be beautiful and, and, and billowy, not twisty and devastating. Winds should be soft and refreshing, not, not fast and destructive. And, and all of these things about the weather, we know. We, we might enjoy aspects of the weather. We enjoy a cool breeze, but, but no one enjoys you know, a, a wind that tears things apart and destroys things. And so all of this, we know intuitively, the weather, the, the climate does not cooperate with us. And scripture tells us that it's because God judged mankind and, and judged the earth. This earth is under God's judgment. Now, I, I can safely say none of us likes hearing that. Um, I, I'm sure there are people who after last week decided not to watch part two here, but thank you for tuning in, tuning in by the way. But, uh, um, and, and I get it. Um, I, I, you know, we don't want to believe that God is judgmental. He's bringing judgment, you know, and you might say, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to believe in a God that brings judgment on the earth and you don't have to. You don't have to, but I, I am responsible to tell you what the scriptures say. Um, you and me and everyone else in our lives, though, really, one day we'll bump into this truth. We'll bump up against the reality and fact that God is judge. And why? Because we're judgmental. At some point, we may ask ourselves, you know, why am I this way? Why am I so opinionated? Why do I feel so strongly about this? Um, why do I judge so harshly certain opinions or behaviors or attitudes or whatever? We tend to be judgmental and we kind of judge God for being judging as well. It's actually because we're all made in the image of God. Way back in Genesis, it says that. that and now, that image has been defined you know, definitely been marred, but it is still there. We are still made in God's image. We're still like God in this way. Even though we often misuse it, God, God did on a, mic, uh, on a macro level what we do on a micro level, really. And, and that, what is that? 
he judged sin. Because that's what a good and great heavenly father would do. If in fact he is good and great. Now see, last week we looked at some Old Testament verses and today we're gonna read some New Testament verses that reiterate what we talked about. The Apostle Paul, writing about the consequences of sin, said something quite interesting in the book of Romans. Romans chapter eight, starting at verse 20, it says, for the creation was subjected, in other words, it had to submit to frustration. You ever think of creation being frustrated? Uh, nature is frustrated, not by its own choice. In other words, it didn't do it to itself, but by the will of the one, God, who subjected it. So Paul says that God changed nature, changed creation, and subjected it, it says, in hope, in expectation, that the creation, now watch this because this explains a lot. If you're looking for an answer and wondering what Christians think about how all of this fits together, okay, here's a, here's a big clue. It says that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. So, translation, the world is in a constant state of decay. According to the scripture, the world is in bondage to decay. It can't help it. It's, it's going to decay. That's why everything slowly dies. Um, it's not the circle of life like we the songs goes. It's, it's the judgment on the world. Sin entered the world. And what happened? Death and judgment came. Death and judgment followed sin. And consequently, we live in a judged world. So things die. Um, our... Our skin gets wrinkled, right? We get more blemishes. We, you know, our hair changes color and then falls out. Um, our muscles hurt more often and they recover more slowly. Have you noticed this? I'm, I'm noticing this. Uh, the older we get, the more we realize life is fatal. You know, uh, we're all dying. Now, aren't you glad you tuned in today? <laughs> I, might, I, I know you're thinking, David, you are just so encouraging. You're just always cheering me up. Yeah. Um, so stay tuned. It's, it's going to get better, but I, I just, we've got to lay this you know, down because this is really, really important. Why is this so important? Why is it so important to understand? Well, every world religion has to at least try to solve this in some clever way. They gotta do gymnastics around this whole thing. It's a very complicated issue, but the scripture is so clear about this, that the world has been judged and all of nature, including us, all we all face and we have to deal with the consequences and the judgment of sin. So things die. And so a couple of points as to why this is so important that we understand is first of all, the earth is in bondage to decay. To decay. We read that in Romans 8 there. The earth is in bondage to, de like, to, to decay. Secondly, it's the result of the judgment of God. We also saw that. And newsflash here, number three, it's inescapable. Nobody gets out of the world alive. We all face the prospects of the final and ultimate judgment on sin, and that's death. Now, uh, again, awful, right? So hang on, don't click off yet. Um, listen to the rest of this verse, because it's important. That the, it says that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and that, continuing and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So Paul says, look, the reason why things aren't as they, as they should be, as they ought to be in nature is because nature has been judged just like we are just like we have been. Look, look at the parallels here. He, he says, you know, people don't act the way they ought to act. Nature doesn't act the way it ought to act. Um, your kids don't act the way they are supposed to act and the weather doesn't act the way it's supposed to act. Um, the marketplace and your job kind of work against you and nature works against you. Uh, it, it's, it's a constant reminder that we live in a judged world. We're under God's judgment. Now, you, you, again, you may say, you know, I, I just don't like to think of God that way. You might say, I just like to think of God as a loving and caring and, you know, just cuddly heavenly father, right? But here's the thing. And, and again, you can think of God any way you want to, but I just have to be honest enough to tell you, this is what the scripture says. You can think of God any way you want, but one day it's going to dawn on you. You're going to say, you know what? I can't get the world to act the way I think the world ought to act. And then we have to ask ourselves, why is that? 
And the Bible has the answer to that. The world has been judged, as we already mentioned that. But someone asks, you mean, okay, are you saying that the reason why my cousin got cancer is because of sin? And the answer is yes. The same reason why my grandmother died of a stroke. Now, my grandmother's sin? No. Sin? Yes. Your, your cousin got cancer because of their sin? No. Because of sin? Yes. Sin is that force. Sin is that judgment on all of us. We've all been judged. We've all been sentenced. The penalty for sin is death and no one escapes it. Now, why, why am I hitting this so hard? You say, David, I think we got it. And that's, that's my goal is that you'd really grasp the seriousness of this. But here's why this is so important. Until we're willing to embrace the depth of the problem, we'll have little interest in the significance of the solution. I'm going to just display that for you there. Until we're willing to embrace the depth of the problem, we'll have little interest in the significance of the solution. See, we're naturally drawn to think, you know, hey, I, I don't think I'm so bad. And most of us would probably say, well, I'm not, I'm not so bad. And consequently, we say, I'm not that bad, and I don't think God really is that good. Now, you might not say that part out loud, but you know, I don't think I'm really that needy, is really what we would say. I, I don't think I need a savior, and I've literally had people tell me that. Until we realize, look, I'm dying, I'm dead, I'm, I'm, I'm a judged person. Um, I don't need a second chance or, or to just try harder. What I really need is I need something that I can't come up with on my own. Only then do we begin to understand the significance of Jesus coming into the world. That leads us to where we're going with the remainder of our time today. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm sure some of you last Sunday were thinking, man, why can't you preach on something a little more, you know, happy, a little more positive and encouraging? Why don't you speak on prayer or preach about the goodness of God or, you know, some promises of God or, you know, do something, you know, hey, five steps to getting more of God in your life or whatever. You know, I, I know you're probably saying, come on, David, my whole week is depressing. So, you know, please give me something happy here to go with. See, I'm, I'm with you on this. I'm with you on this. But the reason we don't like this is because when we look at this judgment, and when I say that and I talk about what's happened to this world and our uh, environment and our, you say, wow, didn't God overreact a little bit? I mean, we just, we just think God overreacted, right? I mean, if, if what I'm saying is true, then, and here we are with these fires and, you know, lightning and pandemics and tsunamis and hurricanes and earthquakes and uh, floods and all these other natural disasters that are happening. I mean, if, if that's a result of sin, I mean, good grief. It doesn't seem like, God, I know we aren't perfect, but boy, that seems like you've overreacted a little bit. It's kind of like when you were a teenager, you know, you come in five minutes late, your parents put you on restriction for a month, right? You, you want to call family protective services or something. It's like, that doesn't seem right. It seems like an overreaction to such a minor offense. And that's what we tend to feel inside. And here's the thing. We think God overreacted. But secondly, we underestimate the significance of sin. So of course we think God overreacted. We, we, we know we underestimate the significance of sin because we find ourselves playing some games with ourselves. It's, and here's the, here's the games we play. For example, one is, I better not do that or God might get me. Right? Uh, and you have your own version of the way you would word that. You know, I better not do that or God might get Or I'm going to make sure I'm good so God won't get me. If we play that game or if we relate to God in that way, we don't really understand the significance of sin. And let me... Let me give you some, what probably is some bad news for you. You've already been gotten. You know, we're all worried about God getting us. We're already gotten. God doesn't have to get you because you are gotten already. We're all born in sin. We're all born separated from God. God doesn't have to get you. If you are breathing on this planet, you're gotten. We live in a judged environment and we're a judged people. See, sometimes like people look at God's judgment as, you know, he's got like some kind of laser, some kind of taser gun or something, you know, and he's God's going around. So you go, oh, you're doing a bad thing, zzz, you get it. And or you, uh, oh, you cheat in school, zzz, you get it. That's not what God does. God doesn't do that. You know, you drive too fast, you get a ticket and you go, well, God really let me have it on that one. No, you drove too fast. You got yourself into that. God, God is looking at a whole broader scale of things than that, that, you know, 
you, you just did, you did that to yourself, and that we do that all the time. But God's not running around zapping people with judgment. We're born into it. Nobody gets by with anything, not, be, not because God is running around zapping people, but because everyone dies. We're all born into sin, and everybody lives under that judgment and penalty of sin. Nobody escapes. So I'm sure none of us like to think of it that way. I, I mean, I certainly don't, and I know the end of the story that I'm sharing here. But I'm responsible to tell you what is the truth. Another way to we know and we as underestimate the significance of sin really is because Christian or not, many of us have the idea that if we are good enough, it's just like if I'm good enough, then I'm going to be able to go to heaven. And you may interpret heaven in you know, different ways. See, if we think we can go to heaven by being good, we really, really don't understand the significance of sin. Here, here's kind of a, a strange way to illustrate this. If you think you're good enough to earn your way to heaven, think about this. Do you think this is kind of a possibility check here? Do you think you could be good enough to stop a flood? Uh, see, if you're saying that you could be good enough to get eternal life from God in heaven, I mean, that's pretty significant, wouldn't you say? If you've got that much leverage with God that you could be good enough to, to earn, you know, for all of eternity to be able to get into heaven, don't you think you'd be good enough to stop a hurricane or stop a flood, stop some, you know, a, something, you know, some kind of natural disaster? I mean, if your good works can't stop the earthly judgment of God, how could they hold back the eternal judgment of God? Because when I said that, could you possibly be good enough to hold back a, you know, a tornado or whatever? You're saying, of course not. That doesn't even have anything to do with it. Exactly. And if your good works can't stop the earthly judgment of God, how could they hold back the eternal judgment of God? A couple of years ago in Newsweek magazine, uh, 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 they rated the most sinful states in the United States. <laughs> Can you guess which one it is? I'll give you a second, okay? If you're with people, with family, you can guess which one it is. This is 2018 that I read this article. Florida, right. Florida was ranked as the most sinful state in the U.S. Um, uh, as of 2020, Nevada has taken over. But, uh, and by the way, on the other side of the scale, Vermont is the country's most virtuous, according to the report. So those of you from Vermont, you're virtuous. Directly from the article, it says, the Sunshine State, talking about Florida, came out just ahead of fellow sinners in California, Nevada, and Texas. And then Vermont, North Dakota, and Maine came in at the other end of the scale as the least sinful states in the U.S. So let's go with Florida for a while as the most sinful state, you know. So what if everybody in Florida decided, hey, they got together and go, let's tell you what, we get, we get all of these kinds of, you know, tropical storms. Let's be extra, extra good this year. And we have all these storms and all these difficulties. So what if we shut down some of the bad industries going on and we cancel all of these crazy spring breaks and calm, town, and calm down Daytona Beach and, and Key West and all that, get rid of some of the really bad people and everybody in Florida focus on being really, really good, so good that God's going to make it so that no tropical storms hit, you know, Florida. We literally are so good that God changes the weather patterns because of our goodness. You'd say, that's absurd. That's, it, it's ridiculous. Why? Because if you think you can be so good that your behavior can twist or overturn God's eternal judgment, you think, why don't we just band together and change the weather pattern? Maybe if we straighten up, huh, here in California, maybe if we straighten up, maybe we can get this pandemic, you know, uh, at least out of our state, maybe even out of America, if we all really band together and we're really, really, really good, we can get this pandemic wiped out. There, there are people literally who think that you can be good enough to get disease, you know, kind of removed from your life. And, uh, and you, you know, you can't. But some people think you can. But scripture is also, and, and our experience also tells us that there is no correlation between your personal goodness and God's judgment. Now, I, as I say that, I want to make it very clear. There are times God can get our attention. God can use difficulties and he can use hardships and so forth to get our attention, to, tell, to, to discipline us, to help us and so forth. But listen, 
There is no correlation between your personal goodness and God's judgment on this earth. None. You can fend off and thwart God's personal judgment because of your personal goodness. No, that, that doesn't happen. Um, we are born judged. Sickness is a part of the curse and came in with sick. So you say, well, hey, I'm not going to get COVID because I'm really, really good. I'm, really, I'm a really good person, so I'm not going to get it. Look, if you're, if you're around people that have got it and you're not wearing a mask and you're touching your face, you know, you're, you're going to get it. Why? Because you sinned? No. Because you weren't good enough? No. Because we're human and we're on a, we're on a fallen planet where sin is, is and, and where we're judged. Think about it this way. Mother Teresa died. Right. Mother Teresa. I mean, she's honored by the Catholic Church as, as Saint Teresa of Calcutta. You know, she did all, you know, all these wonderful things. I mean, she gave her whole life. She said that her mission and her purpose in life was to be a servant of Jesus Christ. I mean, look, right? But she died. Two years ago, Billy Graham died. Um, I was reading by 2007, he had preached to over 215 million people in more than 185 countries and territories. And it, he began preaching in 1947. I mean, he's just given God's love and shared the message of Christ with so many people. You think, wow. And, and even besides that 215 million, but by TV and online and video and all that, I mean, millions and millions, countless, really, numbers of people that he's ministered to. So think about it. If Mother Teresa and Billy Graham can't beat the odds of the curse, I think we can safely say that we can't either. Um, if we can't be so good to reverse the curse in this life, can we fool ourselves into thinking that we can earn eternal life? We're a judged people on a judged ball of dirt and God's not gonna get you, he's already got you. Uh, so now, here's the incredible thing. God is great, God is good, and he is so great and he is so good, yes, he judged sin, but after sin. And this is, if you, if you don't really focus in on anything else today, please don't miss this. After he judged sin, God immediately went to work to take care of the consequences of that sin. Right after sin entered the world, immediately, God immediately went to work to solve the problem that we created. He's so great and he is so good. God chose Abraham and told him, told Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. God had Moses lead the people through the promised land into the land of Israel, and they established a kingdom. And God sent his only son into the world by way of Israel in order to fix the problem that we created. Because God is so good and so great, not only did he judge sin and judge sin severely as, as he should have done, he turned around and got right directly involved in the very problem we created. He's so great and he's so good. He decided not to turn his back on his prized creation. That was the, we, us, we were made in his image. 8,000 years, not to the day, um, roughly, but 8,000 years after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, in another garden, the second Adam, Jesus, finds himself wrestling with the very opposite question that Adam found himself wrestling with 8,000 years earlier. Let me explain. explain. Uh, for those of you who study the Bible, you've perhaps seen, sometimes Jesus is called the second Adam or the last Adam. Um, and this is, he's called this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for example, he's called the last Adam. Paul, the Apostle Paul, saw kind of a parallel and a contrast between Adam and Jesus. Adam was created immortal and was to be God's representative and steward on the earth to fulfill God's purpose. He had authority over the earth was given to him, and he was appointed to control the earth and everything. The last Adam, the reason why that phrase is used, the last Adam, it makes reference that there won't be a third Adam, <laughs> okay? But there's some parallel uh, illustrations here. Um, so Adam was created sinless. Jesus is and always has been sinless. The last Adam, Jesus, was sinless, just like the first Adam. 
And they both, they had, Adam had no, no earthly father, no human father. So Adam didn't and neither did Jesus. See, so there's just some parallels. Christ is immortal. He's heaven's representative on earth. He's going to subdue both heaven and earth. Uh, Philippians talks about how the name of Jesus, everyone will bow. And so there's just this parallel. But Adam's disobedience resulted in death for man, both spiritually and physically. But Christ's death resulted in everlasting life for those who would repent and those who would accept him. So and just like we were born with a likeness to Adam, because we're, we're human beings, we're offspring of Adam, the earthly man, one day we'll have that likeness of Christ. We are a child of God because of what Jesus did for us. Adam was given the opportunity to make a decision that would introduce sin to the world. And 8,000 years later, Jesus finds himself in a garden. But this is the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Father says to him, I want you to do a deed that will counteract that one done by Adam. And Romans 5 talks about this, that the first Adam introduced sin in the world through, through one act. And Jesus making one decision, taking one step and giving himself through that one act paid the way for sin to be eradicated from our life and from this world. See, the issue again isn't was, you know, where is God? What was God doing? What's the truth? The question really is, who is God? Who is this God? He's the God who punishes sin and then turns right around and he and does everything he can to solve the problem that we created. He's good and he is a great God. In Matthew 26, it records this time. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus did that for us. I, I, I want to just kind of deviate here and give a little illustration. Let's say my, my daughter, Joelle, um, dropped my iPhone. She's very intrigued by phones, but let's say she took my phone and she dropped it in the toilet and I hadn't backed it up. There's, it was not backed up. So all of that information, my contacts, my schedule, all of that is gone. What if, what if I could tell, even though she's one and a half, what if I could tell she was really, really sorry? Um, and what if I sat her down and I started explaining to her and I said, Joelle, look, now let me teach you about, you know, contacts and schedules and calendars and, and meetings and responsibility and even electronics. Let me teach you about that. See, sweetheart, next week people are going to be waiting for me and I'm going to not be there. I'm not going to show up. I won't even know to call them to tell them I can't make it because I have lost all of that. And, and um, you know, so I don't know what I'm, I'm going to be doing next week because of what you do. Do you think Joelle would have any clue of what I just was trying to explain to her? You know, it, I mean, she's not going to say, especially as a one and a half year old, oh, grandpa, if you'd explain that for me, you know, to me earlier, then I wouldn't have dropped it in the toilet. That really clears things up for me right now. So that it's all good. Look, a, a one and a half year old, I mean, a, a four year old wouldn't be able to understand the significance of what she had done. So what would I do? The only thing a person can do, the only thing a grandpa can do, right? I would just begin to do whatever I could to solve the problem, to remedy the problem that she created. I would have to pay the price for the problem. So 2,000 years ago, our good and our great and our gracious God and Heavenly Father sent his son into this judged world to face the judgment that we face he was mistreated, he was mocked, he was ridiculed, he was ignored, and he never got the credit he deserved ever. Then at the end of his life, he willingly laid down his life on a Roman cross and was crucified to that cross for our sin, yours, mine, the world's. Sin he did not commit. Only a good and great and gracious God would do that. But you know what, that's not, that's not even the end of the story. 
I mean, who is this God we're dealing with? He's the God who judges sin and then turns right around, starts to solve the problem caused by this judgment. This is the God who answers the question we asked last week. We know the world is not the way it ought to be. Yes, there are problems, right? You've got problems at work, you know, with relationships. You've got problems with our families. Our families are never really, uh, right, as, they, as we really want them to be. And um, the climate isn't the way it should be. And things in the world are never as the way they should be. Um, people, you know, can't seem to get along. Um, oh, I mean, we know how things could be and we know how things should be. But we, it just never seems to be that way. I'm not saying it can't be good at times, but... It's never, we can never say, well, now life is finally perfect. And our, our good and our gracious Heavenly Father says, look, I share your concern because I take no pleasure in sin. I take no pleasure in the trauma that you face in your life. I take no pleasure in the sickness, no pleasure in the death. Jesus lost a friend who he ended up raising from the dead, Lazarus, and at that very moment when he saw the people around mourning for Lazarus who was dead, who he would raise from the dead, it says Jesus wept. Think God takes no pleasure in the pain that we have. God's ultimate goal is to create a world that really the one that we long for. And his ultimate goal is to create a world we would dream of. And if, th if things could just be like we would dream them to be. When God created mankind, you know, his desire was the same as ours is now. What would, it, what would it be like to live in a world without sin, in a world where, where God didn't seem far away? So the Lord came to a man named John, one of his disciples, and he gave, a, gave him a vision of what one day would be like. John was a disciple who followed Jesus. He watched Jesus die on the cross. Uh, Jesus was the one who, uh, John rather, was the one that Jesus asked take care of his mother. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He says, here's my mother. Here's your son. Uh, basically saying, hey, would you watch after her? Would you take her as your mother? And uh, as he was dying, John was the one who saw the resurrected Christ. And John spent the rest of his life saying, a dead man walked, a dead man walked. You know, talking about Jesus rose from the dead. And he was finally exiled to an island. They did, they did that to shut him up. And while John was on that island, God gave him a vision uh, of, what it, of what you and I dream of, what, what future is for us that accept Christ and what he did for us. And maybe it's something you would even, you know, you're praying for all of your adult life, but listen to what John wrote. And some of it's, you know, kind of poetic and may seem even cryptic to you, but in Revelation 21, it says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a, as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. I, I know there's probably been a moment in time or maybe an event in your life when you just say, man, I wish, I, I wish God was closer. You've said, you know, God seems so far away. You ever had this times when you've prayed, you just feel like, you know, is anybody up there listening? And there have been times when you've prayed prayers like, God, look, I don't even care if you change my circumstances. I don't even care if you ask the prayer. If you would just somehow indicate to me, show me, somehow help me feel that you are closer. I, I feel much better just knowing that. If I just knew that you cared, you just seem so far away. And do you know why that, why that is, that he seems so far away? Because there is a sense in which he is. God is all around us. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is here. But there's this certain sense that God is, and we don't get to see him face to face. And the book of Revelation says that that won't always be the case. What you've longed for, what you've prayed for, what we've dreamed for and begged God, you know, God, please be close to me, be near me. Um, that's a prayer I pray often, even for my family, be close to them, be near to them. And Revelation says that one day God is going to create an unjudged world and he's going to come and he's going to be as close to you as he possibly can be 
close and face to face will be the reality. That's what God has for you. And it says, uh, continuing on, verse four, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Why? Look, because God doesn't take comfort in your suffering. What you're going through, God doesn't enjoy that. It says there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. To which we'll say, wow, well, at last, right? Um, I knew it could be. I knew how it should be. My whole life that, with that frustration of having the knowledge of good and evil, like we talked about last week, you know, once Adam and Eve ate of that through, they had a knowledge of both the good and the evil. And, and God shares in that frustration. One day he said, I will make everything new. That's who we're dealing with. The God who judges sin, because sin must be judged. God is holy. God is righteous. God is perfect. The God who sent his son into the world to provide a way to, for us to find forgiveness for our sin. A God who will one day recreate the earth where we will have, we'll have that freedom and, and the knowledge of good and evil and we will choose what is good. That's who our heavenly father is. In a very small town up north, there was um, a father whose name was Don and he got a call from a friend Called him up and said, hey, Don, you know, I went by the local high school where, where his Don's son went to school. He goes, I, I know your son's newly got a license and uh, I saw him sitting in, in the parking lot following the basketball game. And, you know, I hate to say it, but I, I think he's been drinking. So Don drove up to the school and he saw his son and said, uh, he says, hey, uh, what are you doing? His son says, I'm just chilling. <laughs> It happened to be 15 degrees outside, so that was literally true. <laughs> he was just sitting there chilling. He says, son, have you been drinking? And he said, no, no, I haven't been drinking. He goes, are you sure? He said, I'll ask you again, have you, have you been drinking? He said, no. He says, well, you know, I think you, and I, ought to, I, I think you and I ought to drive down to the police station because, you know, there's someone that feels that you've been drinking and um, I really want you to be able to exonerate yourself. So let's, why don't you go, go Come with me to the police station. He pushed back a little bit. He says, well, I haven't been drinking. I haven't been drinking. He says, well, come on, let's go. And they went to the police station. Very, very small town. In fact, the town is so small that the police station's closed that time of night. And they actually had to call 911 to have, have a policeman come down and do the test and open up the police station. And, and Don was very well known and respected in the community. So the policeman came and tested him and said, son, have you been drinking? He said, no. He says, you know, I've been doing this for 23 years and, you know, you just took a breath test or whatever. He said, you know, you've been drinking. He goes, no, no, I haven't. The father finally said, well, tell you what, son, let's, let's go over to the hospital. They can, they can draw blood and they can tell how much alcohol you've had. And at that point, <laughs> with the prospect of a needle, the, the son finally confessed and he said, okay, yes. I've been drinking. Father, they drove him home and father the next day called the principal and said, hey, uh, my son was in the parking lot and he was, he was drinking. And because uh, I know that that's against the school rules and uh, I'm just wondering what would, the, what would the punishment be for that? He goes, well, there's some, you're actually suspended. There's some suspension days. He goes, okay. He says, how many would that be? He says, well, he said, you know, gave him the number of days. He says, uh, he says, well, it's a good thing actually that you know, he didn't have alcohol in the car because uh, that's actually three times as many days. So uh, it's a good thing. And he goes, yeah, well, that, that is a good thing. So he uh, hung up the phone and next morning, the, the father's out the, cleaning up the car, picks up the car from the school and is cleaning up the, the, the boy's car and notices that there is alcohol in the car. He calls the principal back. And he says to the principal, he says, hey, you know what? After I'm going through his car, I, I see that he did have alcohol in the car. How many days would that be? And he says, okay, well, that's, wow, that's, you know, three times the number of days. And, and the son is just angry and frustrated. He says, I get it. I get you calling the principal, but then calling him back and getting more punishment for this. You know, I, I why would you do that? And you know why he did it? Because... Because Don was a good 
and a great father who wants his son to feel the consequences of his bad decisions, to feel the consequences of his sin. And the truth of it is, is that uh, the son was upset and frustrated, but you know what that father did because he's a good father and a great father? All the time he was suspended, the dad stayed home with him and they connected and they talked and they you know, really made sure that their relationship was where it should be. When the son returned back to school, the father did everything he could to help his son because he had a lot of makeup work and some things that he had to do, some extra uh, projects and things that he had to do because, and the dad was with him through all of that, helping him because that's what a good father does. He let him feel the judgment of that sin and at the same time was there helping him, caring for him, loving him, even while he was feeling the sting of that decision he had made. See, here's what, here's what we know. A good and great father understands the significance of judgment and they also understand the significance of unconditional love and forgiveness. Those might seem like polar extremes. Those might seem like they are mutually exclusive. They are not mutually exclusive. The significance of judgment and unconditional love and care and forgiveness, those, those go hand in hand. So your heavenly father and mine did what a good and great God would do when his prized creation rebelled. He let us face the full consequences of, of his judgment because of our sin. Then he turned right around and he got involved in the problem. And he did that at the expense of his own son, his only son, Jesus, because he loves us. Jesus came, he died, was buried, and rose again for us. That's how loving our Heavenly Father is. That's how good and how great he is tsunamis and hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes, all of those natural disasters that rip through this planet. It's not because God's judging a particular people. It's because this world is already judged. If it's not a weather or climate incident, it might be some personal issue. It might be some circumstance. I want you to be reminded when you think, where is God? Why would God? Ask yourself again, who is God? God is great and God is good. In that overwhelming, absolutely, yes, he is. God is not defined by a natural disaster. The event that defines who God is is his son hanging on a Roman cross, buried in a tomb, and that resurrection on that Sunday. That's who God is, and that's who God wants to be for you. Tragedy reminds us that things are not the way they ought to be. But what Jesus did for us, that cross reminds us that one day, they certainly will be. God is great and God is good. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, though we don't understand how or why all of this judgment happens here, we are so grateful that you immediately took your love and care to touch our lives, to reach out to us, even when we were, in a sense, shaking our fists in your face, God, you sent your son, Jesus, to die for us, to be buried and to rise again so that we could have hope, so that we could have forgiveness, so that we could have assurance that we are with you in your family, that we, when this life is over, can be joined together with you. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that assurance. And thank you that even though we feel the sting of that judgment, Jesus took all of that with him on the cross so that we can have true freedom and eternal life. As we close today, you know, I want to just, I just want to pray with you. There may be some of you who may say, you know what, I, I get it now. I see the world is judged. I'm ju I'm, we all are. We're all sinners. But specifically, each of us has to come to God and accept him for ourselves. Each of us has to accept that free gift of eternal life for ourselves. Uh, we don't do that just, you know, as a group. We don't do it. God comes to us each individually and asks, asks us, here's my gift. Jesus died for you. He was buried and rose again for you. Will you accept this as your own 
gift of eternal life. Will you become my child? If you would like to do that today, you know, there's a prayer. I'm gonna just display it here and there's no magical prayer, but it's just a prayer of faith saying, God, I trust you. I receive that gift. I know this world and our sin is judged. I receive that payment that Jesus made for me. You can pray that right now. And as I lead you, it'll be displayed there. Feel free, please pray this as God leads you. And those of you who have already prayed this, and you, you, would you just pray for those who are praying this for the first time? Join me, won't you? Dear God, I don't completely understand who you are or why you do all that you do. But today I understand that you reached out in love by sending your only son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for all my sin. I believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose again to save me. Thank you for offering forgiveness and eternal life to anyone who asks. Today I admit that I am a sinner and I cannot save myself. Please come into my life and be my savior. Thank you for making me one of your children. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that, I would love to know about that. Um, you could private message me. You could message me on Facebook. Um, if you uh, go to the Hillside website, you can connect that way. Or um, if you have my phone number, please feel free to text me or call me. I want to be of help to you. Um, even if you just DM me and say, hey, David, contact me. I want to be any help I can be an encouragement to you. If, um, if you have... Maybe, maybe you're thinking about making this decision. Maybe you say, I'm just not ready to pray that. I'm just not ready to make that, take that step and cross that line of faith quite yet. I, I just need some more information or I need to talk to someone. Hey, I'm here for you. If you prayed that today, you say, I don't know where to go next. I have some information. I have some things I can send you that would be an encouragement and a help to you. And I would just be delighted to be able to be of any help I can in your spiritual walk. Hey, I want to just say thank you again for joining me today. Thank you so much. I count it a real honor. Um, I don't take this lightly. I know you could be doing a lot of things, uh, but you, you join me and I really am grateful. And I hope I can I, that these messages are a help and a blessing to you. And if there's anything I can do to be of help and encouragement, please don't hesitate to contact me. Hey, I hope this finds you well. I hope you stay safe. And I'm really hoping and praying that we can see each other soon. Until then, God bless.